I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Good evening. It's Tuesday, January 17th, 2023. This is the Rutland City Board of Aldermen meeting. We'll start off with a motion to approve the minutes of the previous meeting. So, so moved. moved. Second. We have a motion that has been seconded. Any comments, question, or discussion? Seeing and hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. All right, so we're going to move on to outside the rail. Barbara, if you want to come up first, that would be great. Uh, Barbara Spaulding from the RRA is here. Barbara, go ahead. I'm actually here tonight uh, for the Mentor Connector. But I would like to take this opportunity to introduce the new executive director of the Mentor Connector, John Woodward, and invite you all to a reception on Thursday, January 19th from 3 to 6 p.m. at 110 Merchants Row. And I'll just let John have a few words with you. Sure. Um, thank you so much for having me. It's, it's great to be here. Uh, my family and I just uh, relocated here to Vermont. It's a coming home for us, and uh, we're just thrilled to be here. Um, and I'll just tell everyone in the room that uh, the welcome that we have had here from just everybody across the board, from the owner of Jones Donuts to, to folks that are involved in, in city and town government, has just been over the top incredible. So, you know, I really couldn't be happier to be representing the Mentor Connector and continuing all the great work that they've done. And if you need to dust off your bowling talents, uh, you've got two weeks to dust it off and then come to the Mentor Bowl, which supports our community-based mentoring program at the Bowlerama, as you all know, uh, January 28th. And thanks so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Nice well, meeting well, you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank okay. you. Okay. Uh, moving on from outside the rail, Ted, do you mind if I just see if there's anybody else before we have? Okay, great. Just because we want to. You know, I know you take a few minutes. So is there anyone else that would like to speak from outside? Jack, you want to come up and just state your name and your city residence, please, or your place of residence? Jack Crowther, 24 Telemetto Drive. Quick review, oh, starting um, last, November 2021, a bunch of us requested a fresh look at fluoridation. Mm -hmm. It took about a year to happen, and that took place before the Public Works Committee in October. Um, one of the questions uh, that uh, I was particularly interested in uh, was, was who actually has the authority to fluoridate the city water supply. The very end of the process of um, re-examining fluoridation, it, it, it was um, revealed with a, a position of the city attorney that the um, Public Works Commissioner had the authority and uh, under the charter, and the, the only way around that was uh, either a charter change or defunding uh, fluoridation through the budget process. So in, in line with that, I came before the board uh, with a request that a charter change be put on the March ballot. Um, at this point, the board jumps into the issue and apparently in an effort to protect the fluoridation program uh, declines to put it on the March ballot. Um, it's notable to me that in this whole process of re-examining fluoridation the person who, who was not heard from was the Public Works Commissioner James Rotondo. Um, we heard from Dennis, we heard from, from the health department, we heard from our side, um, but the person in charge um, uh, did not really participate. So my request tonight is that the city hold a public hearing where um, the commissioner uh, appears and is able to tell us why he is fluoridating uh, the public water supply. Um, I think some of the questions that that uh, people will ask, and, and this is an issue that, that very clearly divides the community. There's, uh, based on the last vote we had, there's about 40 percent uh, 
disapprove of it, and I think the percentage would probably be greater today, but I can't be sure. Um, why are you, are you comfortable putting a drug in the water supply of Rutland? Um, are you comfortable with the fact that although the dosage, <coughs> the dose, excuse me, is very um, carefully controlled at six points per million, the dosage, that is the intake of the individual uh, person drinking city water, there's no control at all because the consumption rates of water vary very greatly as much as uh, some people drink as much as five quarts of water a day, so there's no control there. The other uh, question that I think is um, more relevant to the commissioner's expertise has to do with uh, pollution of our waterways, and I know this is within his wheelhouse. Um, for many years, the uh, overflow from our sewer system has been a uh, fairly important concern of the Public Works Department. Uh, and in not too, uh, not too long ago, there was an insert in our bills that said, that asked about um, how do you protect, what can I do to protect streams? This was sent to all um, Rutland water customers and um, points out that stormwater pollution harms water quality and every living thing that depends on it, including humans. Well, um, as I've said a number of times, what we're putting in our water is, is hazardous waste under U.S. law. It's fluorosilicic acid. You cannot dispose of it in uh, a pond or a stream or the ocean, forbidden. And yet, we import it, we buy it, we put it in our water supply. A couple million gallons, one to two, mil one to two million gallons a day are are treated, and this is added to that, and nearly all of it, probably 98, 99%, winds up in Otter Creek, goes into uh, Lake Champlain, which is a major uh, environmental concern of the state of Vermont. So um, those are a couple of uh, the questions that, that I and others, I'm sure, would like to ask the commissioner and so that's my request. Okay. Uh, Alderman Gillum, this is currently in your committee. Um, is it still in committee? It's still in committee. Because the board took action. No, we didn't take action. That's why it's still in committee. Oh, we remain in committee. So um, if you're going to, if you want to work with Jim directly, that would be an well, option as well. So, if I may, I think ahead. a point of order, Mr. Chairman, is a request has to come from this board to set up public hearing yeah absolutely. And that motion has not happened yet yeah, absolutely. so I don't think it's up to Alderman Gillum to hold a meeting until there's a request for a public hearing I'll, I'll make a motion to request the public hearing okay we have a motion to request the public hearing I'll second it we have a second any questions comments or debate Alderman Barbara Gallo no, I just seconded it okay all right I'm sorry any questions comments or debate Oh. So the only thing I would say is that as Mr. Crowther brought up, um, the budget process is probably going to be the best bet if he wants to eliminate the fluoride from the water um, by defunding it. And the budget process has already passed us for this year, um, unless of course the people of the city of Rutland vote down the budget and then it comes back to us and we get to work on it some more. Um, I think that uh, next year, I know it is in the budget, um, it's a two-year cycle, so in November when we get the mayor's budget, um, I'm certainly going to make the motion, as I always do, to defund it, but uh, it'll be up to the board, in my opinion, at that time. Um, I don't see a public hearing or anything else is going to do any good at this time. Uh, we have heard from the commissioner several times over the years. Um, he continues to 
uh, and request the funding for it and direct the water treatment uh, plant operators to put it in the water. So I think that that's the answer that we have at this point. Um, but uh, I would look forward to November and taking it out of the budget. Thank you. Um, is there any, before, before I come back to you, Jack, is there anything, and I said Jim earlier, by the way, my apologies. Is there anything else from, any other questions or comments from the board? All right, go ahead, Jack. Well, I'm continuing my efforts, uh, as I have over the last eight years, to bring this issue to the public and through advertising, letters to the editor and so on, to try and educate people on this subject. At the moment, I am contemplating um, and will probably undertake a petition drive to put the issue of a charter change on the 2024 town meeting. So in the interim, I would, I would like to keep uh, educating people about this subject and certainly um, a hearing with the commissioner would continue this process even though, if, even though it wouldn't effectively uh, lead to uh, uh, a termination of the program unless, you know, unless somewhere along the way he changed his mind and, and felt that uh, the evidence justified it. Okay. So we have a motion for a public hearing. It's been seconded. Is there any further discussion? Alderman Talbot. I'd, I'd ask City Attorney Bloomer, do we need any specific language in that motion to have DP, the DPW Commission, Public Works Commission, or committee hold the hearing, or? I think, yeah, um, I think you may want to um, direct the commissioner to attend as well if you're, if that's the, the goal. Sure, that's um, the intent. Because I think if it's yeah. left open, he, he may not <laughs> accept the invitation. <laughs> Let's uh, say invite the commissioner to attend. So yeah, I don't. It could either be a committee meeting um, where action could be taken, or I, I don't. I think probably Jack is using public hearing interchangeably with just some kind of forum um, that the public can attend, and and you know again you'll have to decide. My commissioner, I think will think the commissioner can't can't be directed to necessarily answer every question. He wouldn't be like uh, it wouldn't be like a congressional hearing, um, but. He could certainly require his attendance and he could decide what he wants to say and what he doesn't. So I think those two, whatever group you would like to organize it, if either committee or just in general, it's probably most people are used to the committee structure, so that would probably be. I'm, I'm good with that if Alderman Gillum is amenable to that. Or you Did, could, didn't we have a hearing? We already? haven't voted. No. No, you but to adjust it. It's part of the motion. It's, well, so Joe seconded it. So you're good with it. So are you good with I'm it good as with a seconder? Okay, so can you summarize that for us real quick? I think what Alderman Talbot was looking for is should it, should there be a, any additional detail in the motion? And I do think it would be helpful to say what group is hosting this forum or meeting or hearing and um, who should attend or, you know, who, right. who in the administration should attend. Okay. So let me see if I can summarize the current motion on the floor. Sounds like there's a motion for a public hearing or a public meeting to be held, which includes the uh, public works director to be held by the public works committee. It's been motions, it's been seconded. Any further questions, comments, or discussion? Alderman Gillum. I just question. We already had this meeting with uh, Chairman Itori. Already had a meeting like this already. Mm -hmm. So we're going to do this again. Well, if the motion passes. The, all of them tell it. I understand that we already had one, but I think what uh, is being asked for tonight is a meeting where the commissioner can answer questions. And the commissioner, I don't recall, was part of the previous meeting. Okay. All right. Any further discussion? Seeing and hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? No. no. Okay, that's 4 3. So. I think that's a fail, right? That's a simple majority. I got to just, Matt, is it simple majority for? You need, you need the six. You need the six. Yep. Okay, so motion fails. Thank you for coming in, Jack. Okay, uh, is there anyone else that would like to speak from outside the rail on matters not on the agenda tonight? 
Jack, do you want to come on? I'm um, sorry, Ted, do you want to come on up and, uh, and uh, give you a presentation? So Ted Plemons, the CFO for the Rutland Public School Systems, is here to give us a school budget update. Well, thank you very much, everybody. I appreciate the opportunity to be on the agenda and provide you with an update of the budget for 2024 fiscal year that was passed by the school board uh, just last week. So I have several charts. I'm going to flip quickly through a few of them, but I've included them for reference. And uh, as we've done before, please stop me if you have any questions along the way or if I skip past something that's of interest to you. So on page two, uh, we have a recap of the recent residential tax rates, uh, sometimes referred to as the homestead tax rate, for Rutland City Public Schools. And as you may recall, back in fiscal 22, the rate was $1.64. For the current fiscal year, it dropped to $1.57. And of course, one of the questions many people will have is, what's going to go in that box for 2024? So I'm going to share some information with you tonight, as well as some estimates that may give a little perspective perspective on that and, and again be glad to answer any questions um, one of the things that's been going on since the fiscal 21 budget um, is the district has been gradually and selectively reducing its full-time positions um, trying to achieve a, a balance and alignment with uh, slight declines in enrollment year to year and of course to be as fiscally responsible and efficient as we could um, that contributed some to the decline from 22 to 23, but the majority of that decline was driven by a very substantial increase by the state in something called the property tax yield. And I won't get into the particulars unless you ask, but again, it's a state-driven metric that's used in the tax rate calculations. And in fiscal 23, that yield was increased by 18% which was an unprecedented increase uh, going back for more than 10 years. The good news for the 24 tax rate is that the state has once again announced a very substantial increase for the fiscal 24 yield. In this case, it's expected to be up by 16%. And the main message there, as we'll get into in a few moments, is once again, we expect this to have a very substantial effect on mitigating any tax rate increases. I don't have a crystal ball, but I do have a few models. And although those models aren't uh, um, accurate to the cent, um, it's generally correct in, in the direction of you know, a range. And based on those models and the information we have right now, our estimate is that the tax rate in 2024 will likely be within a few cents plus or minus of where we are today at $1.57. So the basic message there is we are not anticipating any significant increase or reduction year to year. And I'll explain some of those factors why as we go on. If you'll turn to page three, this is in here just for very brief reference and I can, I'd be glad to answer questions later if you have them. But of course, as you know, the board every year approves two property tax rates, a residential and a non-residential. The important point about this is that your city's municipal rate goes into both the residential and the non-residential. And those two rates also include two different state education rates. And that can be a little bit confusing, but on the next page, on page four, I just have a couple of notes so that you'll know when it comes to the residential tax rate or the homestead rate, that is determined based upon uh, the budget of Rutland City Public Schools, plus additional factors determined by the state. So what we do, what we spend, what we propose, that does have a direct impact on the, the city's residential rate. However, the non-residential rate is not directly impacted by school district funding because the state education rate indicated by item B there is actually set by the state as a function of school spending throughout the state of Vermont. So we have a piece of that, but obviously a small piece. So what I'm going to be telling you tonight really focuses on the impact for the 1A part of the tax rate that is on page 4. 
Okay, so looking ahead to page five and six, I have a couple of key messages. The first is, many of you may have heard of a, a federal grant program called ESSER, and as you can see in the note below, that stands for Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund. Um, there are many billions of dollars that the federal government uh, set aside for ESSER grant funding uh, over a number of years, and this is a significant factor in our district's budget for fiscal 24. The fiscal 24 budget includes $13.5 million of ESSER-funded projects. The important point about that is that is a revenue in and an expense out that does not impact the local tax rate. And I've got that at the very bottom. So what we're spending here or what we propose to spend is a net zero when it comes to the local taxpayer. Now these ESSER grants have been approved so far by the Vermont Agency of Education in concept. And there are a few more stages we have to go through to get final approval for that grant funding. We're targeting to use this, and in fact we have in recent years, for interim positions, and I stress interim, because these grants expire, so as we have hired these people in positions, we've been very clear to say we have no assurance after the grant funding expires on these positions, and some very important special purpose improvements, and I've listed some of them below. The district is expecting to use several million dollars worth of ESSER funds to make some major and needed upgrades to our heating uh, and, and air conditioning systems. We have already started using them to remove asbestos from classrooms and hallways and install new flooring. As we have done that and we have more of it to do, we have had an eye toward reducing future operating expenses. So when you put in flooring that's easier to clean than the old carpet or when you put in newer, more efficient HVAC, you are able, you can plan to reduce your future operating expenses. New windows, the same thing in efficiency. Some new vehicles vehicles, uh, some vans, and some very important IT enhancements because, of course, part of the purpose for these grants is not only to close gaps that occurred because of COVID, but also to make preparations if that were ever, if we were ever to have a pandemic again. And so remote access, the appropriate security, we're making all those upgrades now in our IT functions. Now, again, the key point is all of these grants are going to sunset by September 30, 2024. So we're on a very aggressive, fast track because if you don't spend it by then, you lose it. Okay? Another couple of important messages are on page six. If you exclude this significant ESSER funding that we've got in the budget, and, I, and why would I say let's exclude it? Because with it, it changes the patterns and the trends. So if we exclude it, you can sort of see the base operations, okay? And the base operations for fiscal 24, as I'll show you in a moment, excluding ESSER-related funding, the expenses would be up by 1% in 24 over 23, which when you consider the current inflationary environment is actually, I think, a fairly impressive result. And it comes from a lot of work that was done by the entire administration over a period of many months from October through December to not only look for efficiencies, but also, of course, to hold down spending wherever possible. Um, Compensation costs are naturally up. Benefit costs are naturally up on a per person basis. But our major lever, of course, is the number of positions. And the administration has looked through the district and tried to find positions that, will, that, that we can do without going forward while doing the least harm to our educational programs. And we've selectively utilized um, people who have left the district. We had back in fiscal 22 more than 50 people who left either by retirement or resignation, which is more than a 10% turnover. And what Bill and Rob and the others have done is to be very selective in deciding which of those positions we're going to fill again versus not. So again, the, the idea is manage your staffing, but without um, any involuntary um, uh, departures, if at all possible. The state sets our food service cost limits based on CPI. Fortunately, the district invested in wood pellet boilers several years ago, which um, is helping offset the 50% increase in, in, in uh, heating oil. 
And we did include, and this is an important point, we did include $250,000 in this fiscal 24 budget to begin work on replacing the turf at Alumni Field. Many of you might recall that the last time this turf was replaced was in 2008. Um, the field had a rated life expectancy of about 10 years, so we are well beyond that. It comes, be comes because uh, Casella, who was very helpful in, in doing a lot of the work for us, did a great job. And also, the district has spent judiciously over time to maintain the field. And anybody who maintains a car well knows that by putting money into maintenance along the way, that car is going to probably last a little longer for you. And the field is the same. But we are now past the useful life. And uh, based on the uh, recommendations of our athletic director and others, we plan to begin replacing the turf in the spring of 24 and completing it in the summer of 24. So we have 250 as a starting point. We'll probably Probably need to include another $250,000 in the next fiscal year for a total cost of about half a million dollars. But we're also going to see if some fundraising in the meantime can defer that. So that's a, that's a rather large special item that's in there. But as I indicated to you, we've been working on this for quite some time. The school board unanimously approved this uh, proposal last week. Um, but it, I just want to make it clear that in, in approving it unanimously, they had multiple reviews, both at the finance committee level and, uh, and at some board reviews. Um, so the goal was by the time we got to them last week, it should be no surprises. And, and I guess it wasn't. Now. Here's the big story. If you now include those ESSER funds, that extra $13.5 million, that bumps our budget up to $74 million, which is probably the highest it's ever been, and it would be an increase year over year of 20% which is why you can see I've separated it out because you know if I came to you and just said oh we're going to spend 20 percent more uh, that would obviously raise quite a few questions um, but again considering that that ESSER spend has no impact on the local tax rate um, we think we're going to be able to do this uh, without without burdening the taxpayer significantly beyond the 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 already existing rates so if you turn to page seven You'll see some detail in terms of major categories of expense in the 23 budget and 24. And again, look at that second line in the title. This is excluding the ESSER funding before we, we add that in. Um, and you can see in the second to last line that other category includes the $250,000 um, down payment, if you will, to begin work on the turf field. Then if you go to page eight, you can see I've put the ESSER spending. It actually will it actually will show up in a variety of areas. For example, facilities, IT, and other. Uh, but I've put it just on one line here so that you can see how the ESSER funding relates um, to our our major uh, operations. And of course, we're we're going to be very busy um, trying to to spend this uh, on time and on budget and um, and wisely. But with that, it bumps our budget up from 61.6 million for this year up to 74.1. Okay. If you'll turn to page nine, this is, a, this is kind of a complicated table, and I'm not gonna go through all the numbers, but there's a couple of key points that I'd like to make on this chart entitled cost per pupil. And you'll see in the middle, on the very top line, that's 74.1 million of expenses, so now we're including all of the ESSER funding. That next line, revenues, that's only for federal, in other words, other federal and local funds to the tune of about $35.5 million. When you subtract from the 74, that 35, that leaves a remainder of almost $39 million, which somebody else has to pay for. And that somebody else is the state of Vermont. And this is the state funded portion that is used to calculate average cost per pupil. The state doesn't care how much we spend as long as we get it from somewhere else other than the state, like the federal government. So as I tell my colleagues, if you want to spend $100,000 more, that's fine. Just bring me $100,001 of federal expenses so that we don't burden the local taxpayer. But this is what the state is going to have to pick up on our behalf, which is unfortunately an increase of $2 million year over year. So now it's a little bit of a different trend, but you have to keep in mind the different factors. And that's because the cost in total did go up a little faster than the revenues. 
Part of that is because we are anticipating some le some um, a slight reduction in some areas of direct funding that we have typically gotten from the state and other resources. But again, that that would be getting into the weeds. And therefore, the point is, if you take the state-funded estimate of almost $39 million and you divide by a metric called equalized pupils, which is a derivative of student enrollment, but it's calculated by the state based on enrollment and some weighting factors, you can see that our equalized pupils, according to the state of Vermont, has declined by almost 3% year to year or will, or about 50 students. And so even if costs were the same, the average cost per pupil would go up with fewer pupils. These results suggest that for 24, based on the way the state looks at the metrics, the average cost per pupil in Rutland will be about 20,200, which is in line with the uh, state of Vermont average. I'm not gonna tell you whether being in line with the state average is good or bad, because that depends on a lot of things. In the past, uh, Rutland City has been slightly below the Vermont average, but you know every school district and its needs and its communities are different. And to make a comparison versus the state, the only reason I look at this is because if we were significantly above, then you'd wanna start asking some obvious questions. But again, we are comparable, we're in line, and um, I'm hoping, we're all hoping, that come 25, fiscal 25, um, some recommendations are gonna be implemented by the state that will impact this equalized pupils, and I'll tell you a little bit more about it. So you're probably all familiar with the standard ballot language, and that's shown on page 10. In the past, the ballot language has been mandated um, we are not allowed to, to vary at all. I can't put in extra words to help provide some explanation. Uh, not, not allowed. There are only three numbers that go in based upon the calculations that I showed you before. Now, with that, I want to make a couple of points for your, for your interest. So that 8.3% increase in the average state-funded cost per pupil is, of course, because our <coughs> pupils are going down and our cost to be funded by the state was going up. That 8.3% is a lot. It's not a lot when you compare with CPI inflation. As many of you might know, in seven out of the 12 months in calendar 22, inflation across the country was 8% or above. It more recently has come down for December, it was reported at 6.5%, and let's hope that it continues to decline. But that 8.3% is not outside the range of what, what we have seen inflation-wise. And in fact, there are other school districts, um, including some in our area, who are now looking at possible increases in average cost per student of 14 and 15% because of some of the challenges that, that our inflationary environment is creating. And for that reason, perhaps, the state is currently looking at putting in place a bill, it's H-42, which the governor might sign during the week of January 23rd, which would allow this a release on this mandatory language. So a lot, of, a lot of districts are concerned about putting in what their average increase per uh, equalized pupil is going to be given some of those high rates, so we may see a change uh, man, uh, that is allowed by the, the governor. Now, what we end up doing with that as a school district, our board will decide and we'll certainly keep you informed. So that's what 24 is looking like, and, and 25 will continue to be a challenge. I just wanna let you know, of course, we're already thinking about that as we always do. I always remind my colleagues, um, we're working on the, the current year's budget, but you always have to be thinking about the budget two, three, four years ahead. Um, and so what's coming in 25, of course, is an end to the ESSER funding of both positions and projects. So we hope to utilize that as best we possibly can. As wisely as we can use that, we ultimately reduce the burden on our local taxpayers using dollars, basically, that we already sent to Washington. We're hoping in 25 that um, the state will follow through on, um, I, I think the legislation was S-127 that would implement new weighting factors. You might recall in a previous meeting with you that if the study was implemented as recommended, models that I've seen estimate that the benefit to Rutland City, given our constituency, would be um, 
20% relief in our tax rate, or conversely, if you spent it, a 20% increase in what you could spend at the same rate. So we would benefit significantly from that. Of course, there are other communities that won't, and it's a political process. So we'll see how that works out, but we're hopeful. Our labor agreements are all going to get renegotiated after uh, June 30, 2024. So for 25, uh, we'll be looking at um, you know different cost increases. The um, increases we had negotiated with the teachers and other unions for fiscal 24 earlier, uh, we had locked this in. It was 3.5 percent. So obviously, inflation's been running a little bit above that. Uh, what it is by the time we get to the negotiations will be an interesting point. Uh, and of course, we're hoping that uh, some of the indications uh, of potentially lower inflation in the coming year will come true because that would help everybody. So that's a quick recap of, of what we've accomplished so far and where we're going. And if you have any questions, I'd be glad to try and answer them either now or anytime at your convenience. Alderman Napoy. Excuse me? I said Alderman Napoy. Okay. <clears throat> Thanks, Ted. This is very, very clear as always. Well, very thank you helpful, for that. Very useful. Appreciate that. Um, one of the things that strikes me in this is the line on expenses, revenues, uh, or the second line is revenues, federal and local. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So why do we put federal and local together? I mean, I know that the state, how the state funding works. Sure. On the next line. Um, so can you just explain that a little yes, bit more? Yes, I'd be, glad, I'd be glad to. That's a really good question. So I think let me let me just expand on your question for a moment. And, and it, the question would further then be, well, gee, aren't there many different sources of revenue? And don't you look at them source by source? And the answer to that is yes. We consolidated these two on that one line only for the simplicity of saying, basically, here are the total expenses. Here is a second line that has all of the revenues that are allowed to offset those expenses and then what is left for the state of Vermont. So that line that says federal and local, for example, that has you know, roughly 80 different grants uh, of varying sizes. For example, some of the federal grants you've probably heard about are Title I, Title II, Title IV. There are many other grants that are in there. There's a variety of local revenues in there. For example, um, ticket sales and that sort of thing. Tuitions that we charge to other towns who send their students. That's about two and a half million dollars a year. But again, we've for the committee, uh, the finance committee, and for the board, we split all that out in our more detailed reviews but I consolidated it just so you could see the overall calculation and if you'd like to see those revenues I'll be happy to send them to you so I get the ticket revenues that's not going to be big no it's like about 30,000 it's, it's small exactly yeah. um, when we're talking more about the local revenues I, I understand um, there are there contracts with the surrounding communities that send to Rutland High School? In a sense, that's it. Do they a, all pay the same or approximately the same per student or how, how does that work? That's a great question and in, in effect the answer is yes. It's not a written contract at the local level but it's essentially a contract or an agreement set up by the state and what the state does is they do a study every year and they say okay we are going to say that any town who uh, has students that you know are going to come in and pay tuition is allowed to pay a tuition of up to X. And they tell us what X is going to be based on historical costs. Then it's up to the school board and the administration to say, okay, are we going to charge X or are we going to charge X minus 100? You know, what are we going to charge? And so it's all within the framework of basically a contract agreement. Uh, that is set up by the state and there are protections in that process so for example if um, if we were to charge I'm just going to pick some numbers as an example. If we were to charge tuition of $25,000 per high school student, okay, which is well above our average cost per student of $20,200, and then the state came back and you know they looked at what the costs actually were for the year. Oh yeah, $20,200 was right. That was a good estimate. Then they'd say to us, "You shouldn't have charged $25,000. That was way too much." So the school district would actually have to give a refund based on state guidance um, so that no 
jurisdiction would be able to overcharge unreasonably. And the same is true if we undercharge. Um, then we're allowed subsequently to go back and say to another town, oh, by the way, the tuition that we had announced, turns out it was too low, it should have been this, and we send them a bill asking them for reimbursement. So yeah, there's a whole framework which you could say is basically tantamount to a contract. There's a process that goes on to protect both sides. Yeah, and my point being that if it's at $20,000 to educate someone, we're raising two and a half million in from overall tuitions, right. The overall tuitions, but that also has to go to if we had a bond still on the school, which I, I think that was retired a couple, few years back, right? There was one that was retired a few years back. Yeah. Um, that would have fallen completely on city taxpayers, the, the bond payment. I, be the I believe that's correct. I believe that in the calculations, I'm not 100% certain, but I think you're right, that in the calculations that, are, that determine what the allowable tuition is, mm -hmm. I believe the bond payments are one of the costs that have to get excluded. Okay. But I'm not 100% sure. I could check that for you if you like. Yeah, it would just be, I mean, obviously if the bond's been retired, it's, right. it's moot at this point. But um, and you know, I'm, I'm, yeah. what I'm really getting at here uh -huh. is the, the, the Burlington project that's going to be going on here. Oh, for the high school? For the high school. Uh -huh. And my big question to you is, I've heard that as much as 60% of ed fund funding is going into that school. In you mean 60% of the state? Well, six, it's not 60%, of, but 60% of the funding for that school is coming from the Ed Fund. Interesting. I, I don't know that that's completely true, but I did have a conversation with somebody that, you know, seemed to know exactly what they were talking about. Sure. And it seemed like we would be funding the Burlington High School uh, around the state if yeah. any of that funding is coming from the Ed Fund. So. Well, I, I have to tell you, well, I, I think I'm it's not, something that yeah. you know you guys might want to really check into. Sure. And maybe just send us a letter saying, "Hey, we looked into this, and yeah, that's either that. accurate or no. It's it's more like this, or it's I'm, completely inaccurate." I'm gonna guess. Yeah, I'm, to I'm gonna guess it's. And I will look into it. Thank you for Thank you. raising the question. It's probably like a lot of things. Typically, um, if you and I are having a conversation and if somebody else overhears it, you know, there may be kernels of truth here and there, but they might not hear the whole story and they may get part of it right, but maybe it's not completely right. So the, it, the details matter and I'll look into that. It's probably not the case because my guess is if the state were paying for 60%, Probably we would have heard about it because uh, other people would be unhappy too. But yeah, let's find out if um, if that's the case. It's probably got something to do with some various grant funding too. So, all right. So yeah, I'll I'll be glad to look into that. That's us. Mm -hmm. Senators, so my question, Ted, is um, why would we include the ESSER funds into the budget? And the reason I say that is yes. because, like, we had the ARPA funds on mm -hmm. the municipal side, right. and instead of including them in the budget, we purchased things or accomplished things outside of the tax rate, not putting it within the budget to spend. So, does it help if it, if you raise that ceiling to seventy four or one hundred three? Right. Is that drawing you more money from the state? So, um, it it does not draw any more money from the state because um, that's coming from the federal government and it's a federal revenue in and it's an expense. It may flow through the state but it's not state provided. Um, and it's interesting, it's so interesting that you asked that question Sharon because when we were going through an earlier iteration of this I left out a lot of that for that for that reason. And then we had subsequent discussions with the AOE and they reminded me very appropriately that when we go to town day, town hall day and we vote on the budget, we are asking the voters to give us authority to spend what? Uh, 61 million dollars or 74 million as they pointed out. If you don't ask for authority to spend the 74 million, you won't be able to. So that's the reason why. And my other question quickly is, um you said you have to spend it by September 2024. Or September 30, it. right, yep. So but you, ha you know in 2025 you have labor, labor union agreements and turf. It's going to need more money for the turf. So even though you can't spend it, can you earmark it so you don't have to go to the taxpayers for these improvements? So, um, 
So I'm, we won't need to go to, oh, in terms of going to the taxpayers for the turf field or the labor negotiations, um, we would still be going to them in any case. So it's, iris, it's independent of the ESSER funding because ESSER funding isn't used for like the new contract agreement with teachers or the turf field, for example, comes out of local or local fundraising. It doesn't qualify for any of this COVID related relief. So yeah, we, that, that, that's a good question. And by the way, technically, in a little bit of fiscal 25, we can still use ESSER funds, but it's a tight window because September 2024 means that we've got July, August, and September, which is three months of fiscal 25. So it's possible that if we don't have it all spent, the next budget you see could say, oh, you know, we have a little bit of money left over and we're gonna spend it now. We didn't spend it before, but that's a really tight window to get things done. So we're gonna try and do it all before. Thank you. Thank you. So, uh, first off, thank you for the excellent presentation. My pleasure and honor. Thank you. Uh, do you have some sort of education, public education uh, program set up to explain this to the public? And I say this because they're going to look at that $74 million and it's like sticker shock on a new car. And 100%. if you don't explain to them that you're not paying $74 million, they're going to they're going to freeze up and they're going to vote no. You're, you, we agree 100 percent. And thank you for that question, because we have been talking about that. And um, what we have done in the past is we have typically set up some speaking opportunities with various civic organizations, starting with you now, um, but going to the Rotary Club, going to other organizations, um, Rutland Young Professionals, anybody who we can think of who will listen, um, we would like to speak to. We also are going to be using social media. We also are developing some promotional materials, posters and the like that we can circulate. And a number of us are planning to go around to local businesses. The Rutland Herald, I want to give kudos to because they have been extremely helpful in also explaining it very clearly. Um, so it's a complicated topic, but to serve the general interest of the community and understand what's in and what's out. Um, but if you or any of your colleagues can think of other communications initiatives, um, we would love to know because we have, once we realized in talking to AOE that we have to throw all those dollars in, you know, that was our next thought as well. So we need a simple way to communicate that message. And um, like I said, we welcome all suggestions, but we have that on our radar for sure. Well, I know in the past, I've, at times, I've received a letter from the school board prior to the vote with an explanation. And if they could explain in there what the actual tax rate is going to be and right. that if it's either four cents more, three cents less, whatever it is, right. that to me is the simplest way to explain it. Right. And most people will read that. A lot of people, you've got to force feed them. Right. And they're just going to look at that $74 million, they're not going to read any further. Right. But if you can get a letter to them that says, please read this, your tax rate depends on it, something like that, it might be helpful. That's a good way to put it because as you were mentioning the plus four cents or minus three cents, I was thinking, I don't know how far out on that limb I'd be willing to go because I really like my job and I would like to keep it. <laughs> and if I put out that, that, that prognostication and I'm wrong, you know, I could be run out of town. But, um, Putting it the way you did subsequently, though, that's that's a very good that's a very good idea, and I appreciate that. Yeah, because again, within within reasonable ranges of estimates, we think it's going to be in that in that uh, that zone. But again, you know, you can never be sure. Tom. So Alderman Barbagallo, as he was pointing out, he's predicting the new rate to be somewhere around the 1.57, unchanged. Correct. That's what I'm thinking. So. I guess what my question then would be is, I, I know it's not on the grand list because in the grand list we have non-residential. So what's the residential that people are voting on? It, you're gonna be raising approximately the same amount of money. Approximately, right. And what's that number? I mean, is it the 30? It's the 38, 30, 7 million or whatever. Seven yep. what, I was, what I was adding up, about exactly. 37? Right. So it's about 37 million that's being raised from 
residential taxpayers in the city of Rutland. So let me let me let me say it differently. I need to I, yeah, That's, I need to say that differently. Uh, and and I I misspoke at the beginning. So yes, thirty eight million dollars needs to be raised. Okay, but. That $38 million is not coming all from local taxpayers. Okay. So um, we have a rule of thumb. It's not precise, it varies a little bit from year to year, but it's called the 25 cent rule, okay? And the 25 cent rule is that out of every dollar of educational expense, and now what I'm about to tell you, Tom, is before it gets skewed by ESSER, because ESSER's changing all the ratios, but that'll be over. Typically, for every dollar of educational expense, 25 cents is raised locally. And the last time I checked on that number was a couple of years ago when our school budget was $58 million, and in that year, $14 million came from the city of Rutland. And I think it was about $5 million from the homestead and $9 million from the non-homestead you know, commercial. So. That's the way to think about it. And in fact, what I thought was interesting is, again, you know, of course the businesses don't want to pay more taxes either, but probably because of some of the discounts that are allowed on homestead real estate taxes for income limitations and such, that ended up being, you know, about $5 million out of the $58 million in that particular year. That's after the income sensitivity. Yes, sir. <clears throat> Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Thank you very much for thank coming. Thank you in. so much Great for your presentation. Time. Really thank appreciate you for your it. Suggestions. It's a pleasure. You bet. <clears throat> Have a great night. Okay. We are still outside of the rail. Is there anyone else that would like to speak from outside the rail this evening? Or items that are not on the agenda. All right, seeing none, Mr. Mayor, the floor is yours. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And uh, we appreciate that uh, that education on uh, on uh, what we're going to be spending on uh, and what the voters are going to be seeing uh, when it comes uh, election day. I think that was very educational for everybody, so I appreciate Ted coming in. So um, you have a full agenda tonight, so I'm going to try to make this as quick as I can. Um, I wanted to just let the folks at home know a little bit about uh, some of the discussions and, and you folks here that I've been having recently, um, both here in the city and uh, in up in Montpelier about um, some of the issues that we're having public safety related and um, give you an update on, on some of that. So um, uh, last uh, Thursday, uh, I participated in our monthly project vision meeting. I did it remotely because I was suffering from a, a slight case of COVID that day. So uh, I was not uh, present, but uh, I did um, participate in the um, discussion. We had the uh, state come in, the Department of Children and Families, to talk a little bit about um, what their perspective is on the hotel um, situation. The numbers continue to be um, about as where they were over the last several months. And just talking about what the importance is of having a plan, uh, a plan in place when the voucher pro program ends. And as we all know, that is ending in March. And uh, from my perspective, there still is no plan in place for what happens when that ends. And I think that that's something that the uh, city of Rutland needs to concentrate on, as well as the town of Rutland, and I know um, we all are. Last Friday, uh, the mayor's coalition held a press conference up in the state house, um, talking about priorities for this upcoming legislative session. I have been directly involved in those conversations, putting together uh, uh, the pr uh, programs and the priorities. Those include uh, Act 250 reform, which I think is hugely important for us here in the city to eliminate Act 250 for projects that are inside, uh, especially our, our designated downtown. We already have built a, a zoning in, in place. We don't need um, another layer of, of, um, you know, of issues before us for us to, to build new housing, which is what we all need. We're all talking about housing. Uh, it's a huge issue here in the city of Rutland. Um, we have an ad hoc committee that is meeting. Um, child care issues are important, of course, but public, again, public safety issues, I think, rise to the top. Um, all the mayors agree on that. It's not just a Rutland issue, but it's an issue for the whole state. 
So um, a couple of other quick um, interviews I did. I was on WVMT this morning. Uh, old friend Kurt Wright, um, I spent a half an hour with him uh, talking about uh, the issues that are uh, both with the city of Burlington and Northwestern Vermont, as well as uh, Rutland City. Again, uh, public safety is at the top of everybody's agenda. And today at 4.30, I spent an hour talking with Pat McDonald on a statewide TV program called Vote for Vermont. And we talked about the issues of the day, uh, the upcoming election, and, uh, and again, tried to um, hone in on, on issues involving public safety. And finally, tomorrow at 8 o'clock, I'm going to be in front of the uh, Rutland, County Pub uh, Rutland County Legislative Delegation to reemphasize how important and what a negative influence uh, all these programs are having uh, on, uh, on our quality of life down here and how hard it's making for us to do anything else without addressing those issues because I think those are core issues. Um, I want to emphasize, and we have a couple of members of the department right over here on the other side of the room, um, our police are doing heroic work. They're out there, they're arresting the bad guys. That's a good thing. And you see more and more of it up on public, uh, uh, on, on, uh, in the Rutland Herald uh, and on social media. Um, they are doing the good work. But what's happening after that is where we're breaking, up, breaking down. Um, we need to change the bail laws. We need to continue to uh, uh, um, keep the bad guys in jail where they need to be. And um, uh, until it, uh, those issues are addressed, uh, we're gonna have a hard time doing most of anything else here in the city. So I just wanted to let the public know and let this board know that um, that message is being sent up to Montpelier to our legislators, to the administration, and I'm gonna to continue to do that. So that's all I have tonight. Thank you. Any questions for the mayor? All right, thank you, Mr. Mayor. All right, moving on to additions and deletions to the agenda. Uh, we have one addition we need to circulate. This will be coming later, but circulate the bond warnings for signatures. Uh, that'll be after our discussions. <laughs> Is there I'll any add other additions? Add it to the agenda. Motion to add. Second. Do we have a second. Any comments, questions, or discussion? Seeing and hearing none. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Add it. Thank you. Moving on to reports and letters from department heads and officials. Welcome back, Barbara. Come on, come on up. Barbara Spaulding from the RA is going to talk to us about better connections, grant application referrals. This is pages one through four in your packets. Hello again. So I've provided you with both the timeline for the grant application as well as the pre-application, um, pre calling it a pre-flight form, just to give you a very high level idea of what is being proposed. Um, this came from a meeting I had with Devin Neary and I would be working closely with him on filling out this application and we would just ask that it be sent to um, community and Econ economic development committee meeting to further vet and find the matching funds and all of the things that go along with grant applications i'll tell it so i'll make a motion to refer the uh, better connections grant application to the community and economic development committee second okay. a second uh, any comments, questions, or discussion? Alderman Gillum. So this plan you we put together, that's citywide. Yes. And it also connects to others outside of the city, am I correct? Correct. That's the point of the Better Connections program, so. Just make sure. Alderman DePoy. So Barbara, many years ago, probably 20 or 30 years ago, there were these signs that were put up all over the city for the, <coughs> this is the bike route, follow this. But it was just signs. It really didn't have, there wasn't any infrastructure other than existing road or sidewalk infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So how will this be different from that program from 30 years ago? I'm not sure how it'll be different, but I'm sure it will incorporate all of those paths that currently are marked on the city streets. Okay. Alderman Gillum. This is gonna be really important that we have this plan because when we bring the TIF in here, part of that TIF is going to be infrastructure the city is going to have to do. That's part of the process. And walking issues and biking issues is going to be part of that TIF bond. Mm -hmm. So 
that this is in a good time frame to do this. Yeah, and that, that fight. Uh, All I, the point. That's why I was wondering if there was actually, if this would incorporate actual infrastructure, possibly along the old bike routes that are kind of very haphazardly listed these days. But I still see a couple of those signs around town. You know, this is the bike route, and it's like, okay, we're. <laughs> right. Just the side of the road. Alderman yeah. Talent. So, oh, sorry, Tom. I no, no, I feel so, um, maybe I can answer Alderman Du Bois' question a little bit. My understanding is that if we receive this grant, it'll allow the Regional Planning Commission transportation planner to undertake a study to put together a comprehensive plan. So it may include signs, it may include infrastructure, but we won't know until that transportation planner is able to do that study. And this help, this would pay for that study. It would pay for the study, and then there are other grant funds that would actually pay for implementation. And we can't get those unless we have so we a get plan. Right. <laughs> right. Thank you. So, any other questions, comments, or discussion? Seeing and hearing. Oh, wait, there's no motion yet. <laughs> Can I get a motion? I made the motion already. Oh, you did make the motion. Okay, with motion second. And, that's right. Thank you for the reminder. Uh, okay, seeing and hearing none. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Chief Kilcullen uh, has an executive session that will move to the end. Uh, Treasurer Markowski has a request for a referral for the Treasurer's reports. They've been emailed. I'll move to refer to finance. Second. Motion to refer to finance and seconded. Any comments, questions, or discussion? Seeing and hearing none. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right, any opposed? Motion passes. All right, Treasurer Markowski. Um, uh, we want to approve time donation for city employees, so you should have gotten this handed out. Um, there is, on your desk, um, <clears throat> there's a letter from the treasurer. Uh, we have an employee. Uh, I'm just going to read the letter, if that's okay with everybody. I'll, 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 I'll move to suspend the rules. Second. Okay. Motion to suspend the rules. Was seconded. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. And I'll move for the request, I'll move for the approval of the request for the donation of sick time. Perfect. Second. Second. Your motion has been seconded. Any comments, questions, or discussion? Seeing here none. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Awesome. Uh, okay, moving on. Uh, Commissioner Rotundo, request authorization to sell uh, obsolete city equipment, pages 9 through 13 in your packet. Hello everyone. So tonight I'm asking uh, for authorization to sell two pieces of equipment that we have that um, are really obsolete. Uh, one is the 2003 Holder sidewalk tractor uh, and the other piece is a 2007 GMC Envoy. Um, the GMC Envoy we no longer use anymore and the frame is completely rusted out. We can't get it inspected and we can't get it uh, to pass, really to pass inspection. The 2003 holder uh, is going to be replaced by the two sidewalk tractors that we purchased and they should be delivered sometime before the end of January. The other one, um, we've, we, we had one, uh, one other unit and that's going in for trade and we're going to receive $6,500 for that. This one was in such bad shape that the dealer wouldn't offer us any money at all. So we're going to look to other avenues to try to sell it. I'll move to suspend the rules. Second. second. The motion to suspend the rules has been seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Excuse me, and I'll move to re-approve the request to sell obsolete city equipment, the Holder Sidewalk Tractor of 2003 and 2007 GMC Envoy. Second. second. If a motion has been seconded, is there any questions, Aye. comments, or discussion? Seeing and hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion passes. Okay, um, we have request authorization to issue two R or RFPs for two engineering studies, one Center Street Underground Utility Study and number two Traffic Safety Plan Scoping Study. This is page 14 in your packet. Okay, so the first one again is the Center Street Underground Utility Study. Um, <coughs> and uh, this study will directly support the potential redevelopment of Center Street in addition to the city's consideration of creating a, a, a TIF district. Um, and then the other study, uh, if you recall, we received a $75,000 grant uh, from VTrans 
And um, so we've got the signed contract now, and we want to go ahead and, and hire a consultant to come in and do the study. And that study really is a safety study. Uh, it's to evaluate four intersections on Main Street. Uh, Main Street at Allen, Strong's, West Street, and Woodstock Avenue, as well as look at Woodstock Avenue from Main Street to Stratton Road. And the consultant will specifically evaluate traffic safety with respect to bicycle, pedestrian, and motor, motor vehicle traffic, and make recommendations for improvement. Alderman Talbot. Motion to suspend the rules. Second. Second. Motion to suspend the rules has been seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. And motion to authorize the commissioner to issue requests for proposals for engineering services to perform the Center Street Underground Utility Study and Traffic Safety Plan Scoping Study. Second. We have a motion has been seconded. Is there any questions, comments, or discussion? Seeing and hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, moving we'll on. Attorney Bloomer, approval of police cruiser lease financing documents. Those have been emailed and I think placed on your desk at this point. So, Attorney Bloomer. Thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so you did receive an email. I believe it was 37 pages or so of, uh, of documents that only I had the pleasure of uh, probably reading all the way through. Um, so those, those I've reviewed, um, they've made revisions to those documents um, and they're set to go. Uh, so what we're looking for from the board tonight is um, actually the simplest way to approve the, the documents and the transaction is to make a motion to adopt the resolution and declaration of official intent, which is the document that I um, just distributed to you a few minutes ago. Um, if you, I can give you the motion again in a second, but that covers all of the authorizations um, within the resolution that, that we need. Um, and just as a reminder, this is for the lease of uh, two new police vehicles um, for a total of $106,000 and change. I think it's, it's um, come before the board a couple times, but these are the final documents. Um, and the, the bank would prefer to have us use this resolution and declaration of official intent versus um, the more general uh, resolutions that we've, that we've passed with respect to this issue at prior meetings. So again, the motion would be to adopt the resolution and declaration of official intent in substantially the form presented. And that's all we need. Okay. Motion to suspend the rules. Second. second. We have a motion to suspend the rules and second it. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And motion to adopt the resolution and declaration of official intent as presented. Second. We have a motion. It has been seconded. Any comments, question, or discussion? Seeing and hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Thank you very much, Attorney Lerner. All right, Clerk Heck. We're up, so Clerk Heck is gonna to talk to us about the PLC liquor license requirements. So uh, I, I think for all general purposes, I'd just like to introduce this, and then if we'd like more discussion, we can kind of refer it to the Special Liquor Committee. Um, the Department of uh, Liquor Control, also known as the uh, Department of Liquor and Lottery has gone to an online portal for renewing and new uh, liquor licensing, first class, second class, third class, outside consumption. Um, I'll be politically correct and very respectful and just say it is an extreme work in progress. It's very, very difficult at this point in time. They have basically eliminated the municipalities. There's no reason to sign off on new applications anymore. They're not looking technically for approval from the Board of Control Commissioners. How we get that information to the Board of Control Commissioners, I still think it's important that the municipality has uh, the rights to um, have input as far as that goes, but they're also, they've just cut us out. We're not receiving any funds. Um, the applicant itself is extremely, you know, misled in regards. They just think they can go in to the online portal, request it, and they're going to get their license. It's, it's extremely confusing. In order for that to happen, it has to come back to us. We have to approve it. It goes back to the DLC, then it goes back to the applicant, then it comes back to DLC and stuff again. So, um, and it's, there, there's just, there's more to it. So uh, I think at the end of the day, it, it may be worthwhile just to have, you know, a discussion in committee, just to make sure that the board 
uh, completely understands what's going on. Uh, there's certain folks from the state that have reached out um, since the new sessions come into play and asked about, you know, is there anything that we need specifically in the clerk's office? And I just said, you know, the, the Department of Liquor Control is really, uh, this new online portal is, is not, um, it's, it's not working out. And I don't think it's fair. It's not so much a complaint for myself and, and the work that I have to do. I feel for the applicant and what they need to try and uh, uh, circumvent in order to get their license. Um, the drop dead periods are gone. Um, basically, anybody who gets a renewal, that'll be their new drop dead date. So the amount of work that's going to be increased for the municipalities, all clerks that do licensing and stuff is, um, it, it's just, it's going to be a challenge as far as that goes. So normally under these circumstances, I usually bring you a list of things. I ask the board to go ahead and approve, you know, all first, second, and third class outside consumptions. Uh, just to authorize me to go through. I've been doing this probably for five, six years now and stuff. It's worked out really well. Um, but I think if we could have that dialogue first, just to make sure you folks are comfortable with what's going on, or if you have any questions, try to explain that to you. And then I will be coming to ask that question again and um, uh, to do so. It's the new applicants that we usually circulate for um, signatures. Um, we don't need to do that anymore, but I still think the board should have the ability to hear about the applicant, where it's going, what it's going. If they still would like them to come before the board to answer any questions, we could still do our own uh, paperwork or application where if we needed to get that done and stuff. So it's not like they, the state gets to set all the guidelines. They have just changed how they're dealing with, with uh, renewals and new licenses uh, moving forward. The catering stuff isn't too bad. You know, because again, you authorized me to do that. So when there's functions going on, catering type things, I don't really need to bring it to the uh, to the board. So those folks are are being dealt with uh, proactively. So um, it's just this renewal process, which starts this time of year, is the one that's really going to um, you know be difficult. I think at the end of the day. So I'll move to refer to special liquor committee. Second. We have a motion to refer to the special liquor. It's been seconded. Any comments, questions, or discussion? <laughs> Seeing and hearing none. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Tom? I, I just wanted to ask uh, the clerk. I'm sorry. I didn't turn debate or questions, and if, if you'll allow me to. That's totally good. Um, so, Henry, you know, when this stuff came to us, we also were able to hear from the police department if there were any issues right. for renewals or if there were any issues from the applicant that you know none of us here would know about or know the person or anything so is this board complete completely being overridden and everything's going to the state or is the law enforcement and or uh the powers that be i guess uh are, are they going to be able to come in and speak to us and let us know so that we can at least voice our opinion as to whether an establishment should either be a shut down as we have done in the past with several problem places, or be a, a, a new applicant not getting a license because we obviously know them or law enforcement knows them uh, to be a, a potential risk. Does the state even care in this process? From what it sounds like to me, you're telling me is we're being completely overridden here. Uh, that I no, that's not what they're they're doing. At the end of the day, I still have to push the button that says approved. Until that happens, nothing happens. They're just, they're just out there in cyberspace just waiting for us to approve their application. So I think really the discussion is how the board wants to move forward. If, if uh, you know, this information still can be presented to you, we still have input from the PD if there's uh, problem folks out there that we're able to make recommendations or those kind of things. It's the applicant, Tom, that really has the issue. You know, I've been dealing with some of these guys, you know, bar owners have been here for 40 years. They'll come in and they'll, you know, chat with me. They'll come in with their paperwork, we'll go through it. I, I do a pretty, uh, you know, lengthy uh, presentation, outline, I designate the city of Rutland and how much should be the check should be made out for, the state of Vermont, how much the check should be made out for. So it's been a process that, when I say I enjoy it, it's, it's part of the process that, you know, I feel we should be dealing with for the applicants. Now the applicant's just being told, go into this portal, 
and I believe they're being told you'll get your license. But that's not true. There's, there's a new entity up on North Main Street wants a tobacco license. I haven't approved it because they also would have a second class license. I was going to deny the applicant and the state asked me just to, you know, just to email back to them. We need further you know, information or whatever it is. And I left my contact phone number. It's been eight days ago that you know, I've done this. Now it's close to my house. You know, need to stop in and say, hey, by the way, I'm the city clerk. In order for you to get your tobacco license, you need to call because what about your second class? So applicants are just being kind of left to dissect this new portal by themselves. Um, but the input from the city and what you folks would like to do or continue to do or what we've done in the past, I still think we can do that. It's just a matter of those applicants thinking that this process is a little bit quicker and not as diligent as it was before is wrong. And they need to be educated how, you know, they have to pay the city. So until I re receive the funds that we normally get, my recommendation at this meeting would be we're not going to push the button to approve. You know, until everything is cast in stone and we're good to go on our end because it includes a business license, which the, you know, the state knows nothing about and stuff. So it's, it's, it's more complicated, I think, for the applicant because they have no guidance. They don't know what the proper step should be. And then I think within my department, it's, it's either going to be forwarding on a new information letter saying renewal process has changed. This is what we need to do moving forward. Don't bother contacting the state until you've been to the city, you've dropped off a check, and you've gotten your business license. But again, the board at that meeting or you know, when we have the meeting can make recommendations or however you would like to see the process <coughs> proceed. For me, all I really care about is making sure it's clear and the applicant understands how we as a city want to move forward and then how the state is going to move forward after that. I think Henry answered my question. It was going to be, I, I, I thought what you were saying was there was no check to the city and there was no revenue to the city and that was a concern. As far as the state's concerned, Alderman uh, Davis, they're saying that we have to be paid before they move forward, but uh, I don't think the applicant is understanding that part of the process, how, how it was before. Before, you know, it was kind of tedious, big packet of paper went out and stuff, but I broke it down and they understood what was coming, what the state expected, what the city expected, it all came back to us. And I understand with technology and, you know, quicker, faster, easier payment, the whole nine yards, but it, it's just, I, I can honestly say I don't feel good about how it was presented or how it's moving forward at the moment. Thank you. All right. Any other discussion? <coughs> <coughs> okay. Moving on to reports of standing committees. Alderman Gillum, you are up first with the Public Works Proposed Bond Request. This is pages 15 through 22 in your packet, and there's been some additional here. Are we on committee reports? Yeah. What's that? We're on committee reports. You. Thank you. You're up. No, 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 you're vice chair of liquor. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're welcome. Or Mr. President, I'm sorry. Either way. Okay, Pub Public Works Committee had a meeting on January the 5th, 2023. Committee members present was Barbara Gallo, Cupola, Depoy, and Gillum. Other members present was Talbot, Dungess, and Davis. Other members present was Mr. Kepsis. Did I pronounce that name right? Kessel. Kessel, thank you. Sorry, I'm not trying to kill your name. Um, Mayor Lair, Public Works Department, Commissioner Rondondo, Assistant City Engineer Ted Gillum, City Treasurer Markowski, City Attorney Bloomer, and a member from the public, which we did not know their name. There was two issues in committee. The first one was no fault water damage reimbursement request. Uh, for 79 Granger Street. The meeting was called to order at 5.30. Mr. Thomas Kessup requested funding of $15,000 for the no-fault water damage reimbursement policy. The city attorney presented documents to support the homeowner's request. The city attorney informed the committee that all documents to support the request and the letter from the Public Works Commissioner on the water damage and the, from the water line break of 600 thousand gallons 
on Granger Street and support his claim and qualify him for reimbursement. After clarification of the invoices of the work order, labor and equipment replacement for 79 Granger Street Homestead damages, the following motion of the committee was made. Alderman Barbagallo moves at the full, to the full board for approval to reimburse the property owner, Thomas Kessup of 79 Granger Street for invoices of service rendered and equipment replacement at the cost of no more than $15,000 pending an agreement and release document provided by the city attorney for the Board of Alma meeting on January 17, 2023. The city attorney will present in the agreement to the board the dollar amount of each invoice to be reimbursed and be approved by the board. Motion passes for zero. And I so move. Second. We have a motion. And, and I'm supposed to do it. something else now. Yeah. <laughs> City attorney. Is there any comments, questions, or discussions? So, so, so there is a, an agreement and release that I circulated to the right. board that um, basically accomplishes uh, everything that was in that motion. So. Um, you know, you could replace that motion with just uh, authorization for the mayor to enter into the agreement and release. So do you want to do an amendment or strike all and add an amendment? Whichever is easiest for you to articulate. I think what, what we recommended in, in committee can be replaced by just a simple um, authorization for the mayor to enter into this agreement and release. Probably a strike all is an amendment to strike all and replace with that verbiage is uh, yeah. the simplest. So I'll offer the amendment to strike all um, on that motion uh, and substitute it with uh, the motion that's here on the eight and a half by 11. Okay. Would you mind, read would you mind reading it for us? <laughs> have to read the motion. The motion is to approve Thomas Kessup's request for reimbursement under the no-fault water damage reimbursement policy and to authorize the mayor on behalf of the city to enter into the agreement and release in substantially the form presented. Second. Second. Okay. We have a motion or an amendment, I apologize, and has been seconded. Any comments or questions or discussion on the amendment? Do you want to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to uh, say that I appreciate the support from the board on this. Um, I know it took a little while for me to come uh, to get to the place where I felt comfortable going forward with this, but it's the absolute right thing to do. This is a, an event that happened through no fault of Mr. Kessips whatsoever. It was a, a, basically an act of God, and um, th this is we're doing the right thing by doing this. So thank you. The time to thank the board as well. I appreciate everything you've done. I appreciate Mayor um, for presenting it to the board, and I appreciate uh, the resolution. So thank you guys very much for everything. Just, just for the public know, there's also an exhibit A in here. For some of the members did not see that, because that was a member of discussion or a topic for discussion, how this money was going to get spelt, spent. It's actually laid out how the uh, contractors or folks are getting reimbursed directly from us to whoever is on this list to be no more than $15,000. Is there any other discussion on the amendment? Seeing and hearing none, we'll vote on the amendment. So all those in favor of striking all and replacing with the verbiage that Tom read, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. So now <clears throat> we'll vote on the entire amended motion. Um, Tom, could you read it for us one more time? Would you mind? Ooh, I'm sorry. Sharing? I took a I, I, yeah. I got it. Yeah. I just took his white line out. So the final motion, as we struck all and replaced, will read. Uh, so the motion is to approve Thomas Kessup's request for reimbursement under the no-fault water damage reimbursement policy and to authorize the mayor on behalf of the city to enter into the agreement and release in substantially the form presented. Okay. And that is, uh, that does follow here. Okay. Is there Second. any discussion on the amended motion? Seeing and hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Thank you very much. You can continue with your report. Thanks, TJ. Thank you. Thank You're you. welcome. Thank you. Thanks, TJ. Good luck. Okay. We still continue? Okay. Yeah, continue with your report. The second Thank item uh, on the agenda was the um, bonds proposed for the public to vote on. 
Public Works Bond Proposal, the, the Public Works Commissioner presented information on the Department of Public Works continuing plan to improvement of streets, sidewalks, water and sewer lines, replacing replacement, and the CCO pollution control. The Commissioner presented a PowerPoint uh, documents to explain the bond request, see the handout, which I did not hand out, I'm sorry. After some debate and clarification on the proposed bonds and how the bond request will be matched by the state and federal funds, the commissioner presented how the aging payment schedule of general fund bonds, streets, sidewalks, and st structures, the water fund, water main replacement bond vote, uh, fund bonds, excuse me, and sewer fund, the CO, CSO, accommodation sewer overflow and pollution control bond, but well, that's a mouthful. There was a summary request, uh, requested C chart 15. And I didn't give you that chart 15, so I'm gonna read a little bit to you so you know what we're talking about. So the summary of the bond request is a five year window, paving $1 million, sidewalk $1 million, structure replacement, $1.5 million, water main replacement, 2.5, combination sewer overflow and pollution control is $4 million. But we are gonna have a motion to fix that because there's some changes. So the first motion, I'm just gonna put the motions that came out of committee and we're gonna to have to adjust one of them because there's some new numbers that came in from the commissioner. <clears throat> Alderman Gillum, can I just <clears throat> ask a, um, a request? It's difficult in, in the process of what I need to do to circumvent these motion type things. If a motion in committee is going to be changed at the board level, make the motion, right. but don't so move it and don't second it, okay? Because what happens is then we're going to strike or we're going to amend, and then I'm telling you it's, it's, it's extremely difficult to navigate that. So I'm just trying to figure out the cleanest way possible, especially when we have some things like this bond. This information is going to go to the bond council. It's going to be placed somewhere. I don't type what I want to type. I go back to this recording and I start to print exactly what is said verbatim, okay? So respectfully, it's like the last motion. It came out, it was seconded, and then it was basically eliminated when we start with a new motion. I think it's just much cleaner if you, if you state the motion in committee <coughs> and state that we're going to have a new motion that will be presented. That way there, the original motion comes out. It's not being amended. We've, we voted on an amendment that actually was twice when it needed to be one time, so. You vote on the amendment and then you have to vote on the full motion. Okay. Sorry. So <laughs> when we're, we're looking at this, I just want it to be clean for all of us. Yeah. And I just want to make sure that we're understanding. So that's just a request or a recommendation. However you, however you folks present it, I am going to type it up. So when you're looking at the minutes, if things don't make sense, I'd be happy to share the, uh, the digital recording with you because that's what I got when when we were doing it. So I just want to see if we can um, make it as clear as we can. So um, just for clarification, Mr. City Attorney, <clears throat> my concern is that if we have a motion coming out of committee, that's the motion that's been approved by the committee that then the board gets to vote on without suspending the rules because it came out of committee. If we don't make that motion and we decide to make a different motion, do we have to suspend the rules for that new motion? That's my question. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's it's a nuanced question as far as what's going to be cleaner in the in the minutes. But I think the problem is when it comes out of committee, it's not necessarily up to. I, I mean, I know we've kind of we all assume that if it's a recommendation that that, that I make, that likely there's going to be six votes to go ahead and do it. But there may be an occasion where there's not. So I'm not sure it's up to the committee chair to just say, all right, this is what the committee voted out scrap that um i'm just going to read a different different motion so unfortunately there i think there either needs to be that motion needs to be voted down and someone needs to put the new motion up or the motion needs to be amended to the new motion so i don't know if, if the clerk has a preference as to either of those like whether it gets amended and then that's voted on or whether it's voted down everyone kind of says yeah we'll vote it down and then someone will put the the 
suggested motion on. Either, either of those methodologies is fine. I just think it's, it probably needs to be disposed of one way or the yep. other. Um, I had planned on doing formal, it. Formally, rather than um, so the motion. Left out. So, so to make sure that we do it right out of committee, not to, not to contradict, but to make sure we do it right out of committee, Bill would need to make the motion. Someone would need to second. Either we say no, or we amend. Those are our two Correct. Okay. Yep. All right. All right. That's just to make sure. Sorry. We'll try to make it easy. I'm just going to type it up the way I hear it. Okay. So okay. when you read it. Okay. All right. So I have three motions, one for each bond. First motion. Alderman Barbara Gallo moves to recommend to the full board for approval to be added to the ballot of the town meeting March 7, 2023 for voter approval, 2.5 million water main replacement bond pending legal bond question for the ballot from the city attorney. And I so move, it was four zero. Second. Second. Hey, we have a motion. The reason why I put, oh, go ahead. The reason why I put the language because the city attorney has to sit down with bond council and the clerk and figure that out because we did not have that in front of us. So we have a motion has been seconded. Is there any comments, question, or discussion on the motion that's put forth? Do you have to amend it or change this one or is this one good? This one's good. Okay, so this motion is good. Is there any comments, question, or discussion on the motion? Seeing and hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. All right. Second motion. Alderman Barbagella moves to recommend to the full board for approval to be added to the ballot of the town meeting March 7th, 2023 for voter approval 4.0 for the CSO and pollution control bond pending legal bond questions for the ballot from the city attorney. And I so move that was a 4-0 vote. Second. We have a motion has been seconded. Okay. Comments, questions, Mr. discussion. Alderman Mr. Gill. Chairman, I would suggest we vote this down because I have some new numbers for this particular one. We did not talk about it in committee, but the numbers are actually going to be better than what we're asking for here. So I will, we're going to vote this one down and we'll put a, suspend the rules and bring another motion up. Great. Okay. We have a, a motion has been seconded. All those in favor? Any opposed? No. no. Motion fails. Alderman Please. Gillum. I'd like to suspend the rules to put a new motion on with a new number second, on the floor. Second. We have a motion to suspend the rules. It has been seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. I'd like to move uh, that we recommend to the full board. I'd like to move that we add to the ballot town meeting on March 7, 2023 for voter approval 1.8 million for CSO and pollution control bond pending legal bond question for the ballot from the city attorney. Second. We have a motion. It's been seconded. Any comments, questions, now or discussion? The commission needs Mr. to talk commission, about Mr. Commissioner, yeah, come on up. Well, the amount was $1,850,000. Thank, thank you. Yeah. Stand corrected. Okay. So do you second or accept that change? Okay. okay. So it's one million eight hundred. I'm sorry, that was correct. 4.85. Yeah. There you go. Uh, Jim, Jim, did you want to comment on that at all? Yeah, yeah. So basically, um, so this originally I proposed the $4 million uh, uh, article. And um, basically what we did, we, you know, we had a long conversation with our bond council recently. And um, his advice really was to just have these two projects, which I passed out to everyone, the combination in Piedmont Pond Improvements and the Meadow Street uh, Combined Sewer Separation Projects to just take care of those with this article. Um, so we took out the additional monies um, that we wanted to apply to our long-term control plan, CSO um, list of projects, uh, because really they're not, uh, the feeling really was they're all conceptual at this point and the costs associated with them were all conceptual. So we felt that if we, um, you know, we'll be back to the board here shortly to get some of these design contracts approved and once the designs are done, we'll get better numbers with respect to the cost, and then we'll come back and, um, and ask the board for additional funds at that point. Okay. So, uh, Commissioner Rotondo, you, you had given the committee um, and us present there uh, a breakdown of what the impact was on the water sewer rates or family two or yes. family four. That obviously is changing with the CSO decreasing. So maybe the next time you come back, we could have some updated numbers so the voters know what the impact is to water sewer and what the impact is to general 
Absolutely. We'll present that at the public meeting as well as we're going to have an informational meeting too That's to explain all the report. bonds and we'll definitely get into all of that. Thank you. Michael Alderman Talbot, sorry. Just a question for the city clerk. So I see here that it's assigned bond article numbers. Are those fixed in place? And what article number is the local option tax? So it would be two separate things. The, the charter question will be under charter article. It. It'll be article number one. And I believe number two, there was two questions for the charter that be placed on the ballot. And then the bond articles will be one, two, and three. And I just noticed, Alderman uh, Talbot, how it looks like this is bond number three, or bond article number three. I stated to um, our bond attorney, I had no preference about which was number one, number two, or number three. I think he just went through there. So again, in regards to the report, how it was taken in that order, that hierarchy and stuff. So um, yeah, we need to make sure whatever was passed and how it was passed that three is three, two is two, and one is one once we go into um, setting the meetings and, and doing all those things. So I believe that they uh, could be interchangeable if they need to be to make sure that we're, we're matching up with the, the wording. Any other comments, questions, or discussion? Seeing and hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. And our third motion, uh, Alderman Barbagala moves to recommend to the full Board of Alderman for approval to be added to the ballot the town meeting March 7th, 2023 for voter approval, 3.5 million for sidewalks, structure bond, pending legal bond question for the ballot from the city attorney. And that came out 4-0, and I so move. Second. Your motion has been seconded. Any comments, question, or discussion? Oh, I'm sorry. Paving. I forgot a word in here. Oh. Yeah. Do you want to just repeat So it? that will be, the word should be 3.5 million sidewalks, paving, and structure bond. Okay. And I'm fine with it as fine the second. Fine with the second? Okay. So your motion has been seconded. Any comments, question, or discussion? Seeing and hearing none, all those in favor? Uh, Aye. Any opposed? No. Okay. That's, uh, do we, what do we need on that? We need six. six. We got one, two, three, four, five, six. We got the six. Okay. Motion passes. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Okay. Mr. No, no, I'm not done yet. Oh, you still got more to go. All right. Committee discussed the need for a town meeting, uh, town hall meeting style gathering to explain the taxpayers' the public works plan, where we are how the funds are going to work for the next five years. This meeting should be set in February and invite PEG TV and others to come in and film it so we can continue to educate the taxpayers. The meeting adjourned 6.45 p.m. And that's the end of our report. Thank you very much, Alderman Gillum. President Why is that always ours? It's so complicated. If I may, Alderman Talbot, I think that uh, the information that came out of the committee there is that stated the next motion or motion number one, motion number two, motion number three, it didn't signify bond one, bond two, or bond three. So I think we're okay with the listings of how we have bond one, two, and three, the language is in there. Unless you folks hear something or see something that I'm missing just based upon how the information came out, attorney. There is something in these, uh, in the resolutions that the bond council prepared yep. that does um, number them. Again, not sure if there was any rhyme or reason, but that it, I think we're going to put, they're going to approve these tonight, right? They're, yep. Yeah. So if, if there's, um, they coincide with those resolutions. Yeah. If you, oh, these, these coincide with the resolution. Yep. Okay. If you wanted to change the order, I would recommend that when you pass these resolutions that you just, um, make a note that the resolutions are passed with um, you know the the revision to the the bond article number to you know whatever you'd like it to change to so we just wait until those get on the the uh the table um to then have a discussion maybe they're randomly in the in the order you'd like like to see them you don't have to do anything um but if there's a, a specific order that the board would like to see it probably awesome. makes sense to um approve these resolutions with the amendment to the, to the to the resolution that reflects whatever order you would like to have them 
Alderman Gillum. Mr. President, it was our intent from the committee not to number them. We did that on purpose because we wanted to leave that up to the city attorney and the clerk to decide how that's going to work on the ballot. We did that on purpose. That's why we put that language in there. It's up to the city attorney to decide what that language is going to be. So that's so there is no one, two, three from committee. Just to make Mr. Talbot feel a little bit better. Yeah, and I think I. I and that Alderman Talbot may, may or may not still have this interest, but it sounded like in, in committee that there might be some um, some interest by the board in discussing. You know, what should go first? Normally, Henry would put it in whatever order it appears or however he feels. You're speaking is. of the ballot specific? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And if the board do, does want to have a discussion about that, then um, I think it would be. I can address that. It would be good to have it tonight and to, you know, these are numbered. The bond, bond council did um, provide them in a numbered order. So I think if it's different than what the board would like to see it. Alderman Talbot. Alderman Talbot. So I think maybe I unnecessarily opened a can of worms. I was more interested in the local option tax and then hearing that it's um, separate and won't be in a sure. sort of yep. um, numerical sure. list along with these bonds. Yep. Then I, I don't care what order these are in. So if I may, uh, traditionally, the March ballot will start with the candidates. Um, we'll go through mayor, treasurer, assessor, uh, board of aldermen, one and two year seats, school commissioners. We will move on to this, uh, the budgets, school and city. We'll move on to the charter uh, question, uh, local option tax, I believe there's two. Then we'll move on to the bond articles, one, two, and three. They were asked to be three bond articles. It could have been one bond, but it was broken down into three, so there's three independent questions for those. And then the social service request at the very end. So that's how the hierarchy of the, uh, the ballot will be for March. If Everyone is okay with that as far as that goes. But yeah, the charter and the bonds are, all those things are broken up independently. That's Budgets, all. candidates, and so on and so forth. Thank you. So if I may, we have the questions here. Yep. We need to move them, approve them, so that they're on the ballot as written? Yes. Okay. Should that happen out now? Yes. I think under new business, that was th that's what I wanted to have added. So we're going to take that up at the end of the meeting oh, under new business. business. Okay. Yep. All right. Okay. Anything else? Perfect. All women savage. Hey, um, charter and ordinance met January twelfth, twenty twenty-three. The members present were. Self, Alderwoman Taddeo, Alderman Kukuli, others present were <coughs> President Dungis, Alderwoman Davis, Alderman Talbot, Alderman Barbagallo, Alderman Depoy, and an Attorney Bloomer. The meeting was called to order at 5.32 p.m. and the committee met to review the proposed parking ordinance and approve the language for the, news the newspaper warning of the changes. Attorney Bloomer stated that in reviewing the charter, he discovered that it needed updating to include the definitions of the terms parking app and parking kiosk, and to allow the use of credit cards and other payments through a parking app. Alderman Talbot asked for the new language and it to be more vague to take into consideration the use of any future means of collecting parking. And Attorney Bloomer said it was difficult to account for unknown and new technologies. Attorney Bloomer also said that the language was needed in the ordinance to clarify those persons with purple hearts or prisoner of war license plates that were not obliged to pay, uh, obligated to pay for parking at the meters and the parking kiosks, as well as allowing the police chief to designate someone outside of the department to collect the deposited money and assigning the responsibility to the, uh, to the city treasurer for parking payments made by credit cards, the parking app, and other electronic means adding parking kiosks and parking app related expenses to the list of items for which the parking meter funds can be used was also added. Alderman Barbagallo asked about the different zoning for parking and if people would be able to pay past the time zoning allowances with the app and Alderman Talbot explained that we would work with Park Mobile to determine the zones and timed charging. Alderman Talbot also said that the city has mapped all of the available metered spaces. Alderwoman Taddeo made the motion to send the new parking ordinances to the full board for approval, pending the changes made to the draft suggested by Alderman Talbot. And I so move. Second. 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 We have a motion that's been seconded. Is there any comments, questions, or discussion? 
Alderman with the point. So, Mr. President, <coughs> after the meeting, I was kind of reflecting on the meeting and wondering to myself why we have the police, um, I guess, drain the meters, the meters that have money in them. And in the committee meeting, we talked about, well, it's a matter of trust as to, you know, when people are emptying the meters out, do we trust them to bring the money to the treasurer's office and that, that way the city gets all of the, the coinage money. It seemed to me it was more about safety of the person that's emptying the meters from assault or anything else if somebody knows because I think it's like a little wheeling case of some kind that gets pulled to the treasurer's office full of coins. And in here we talk about um, we talk about allowing someone other than police uh, to bring the payments to the uh, I'm looking for it here designate someone outside the department to collect the deposited money so I guess I have a question kind of for the chief and that is do you feel, Mr. President, to the chief, do you feel that it is safe in the city for somebody to be emptying those that is not a member of the police department, emptying those uh, meters and bringing, I don't know how much money it is, <coughs> each night or once a week or however many times they're emptied from the locations downtown into the treasurer's office? Or should it be an, a member, a sworn member of the department? Well, is this referring to the, using the third party collect, to collect by way of the app? Uh, no, it, it, the reason this is, came up, and I may have complicated things, in reading through the parking ordinance for purposes of accommodating the app, um, I noticed that there was language that right now it must be a member or members of the police department so it doesn't necessarily have to be a police officer but it has to be a member or a member me, member or members of the police department so while we were in here um, making changes i had suggested that maybe we change that language now to person which would still allow you to continue to use a member of the police department but if at some point you due to staffing or whatever else you found somebody else who was not a member of the police department that you wanted to, to do the collections that it would already be um, allowed by the by the ordinance. Um, again, this doesn't require that you use someone outside the department, but it does allow for it. So to Tom's point, if there's a safety concern, um, then maybe it should stay the way that it currently is. I hadn't thought of that. But I had offered the trust as my hypothesis, but that I think you're probably right, Tom, that it, that's more so the reason is that it is well, it used to be probably quite a bit more than it is now, um, and the parking app will reduce that amount as well. Uh, but I, I think you're right that there is some exposure for that person carrying the bucket or whatever they use. Yeah, so, so the process is not as secure as, as you suggest. <laughs> I'm going to leave it at that. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll read it to you real quick again, and then you can answer mm -hmm. just based on hearing it. It says, as well as allowing the police chief to designate someone outside of the department to collect the deposited money in in the meter heads uh, and assigning responsibility to the city treasurer for parking payments maybe a credit card so it would allow you as the chief to designate Gordon Drachillo of the Herald <laughs> to go and pick up all the money and bring it in the treasurer's office if you felt that that was either necessary warranted or allowable um, my question to you is, is should someone who's not a sworn member of the police department be handling that money that's coming in, or would that pose a risk to the city if that person would be assaulted um, while transporting, I don't know how much money, into the treasurer's office? Well, I think given, as I said, the, the process is not as secure as you, you first mentioned, so my preference would be um, 
with the current process to have a sworn officer uh, performing this task, but at some point in the future that uh, it, it may be viable to use someone outside the department. Okay, and this would allow for it. So if that language mm -hmm. is acceptable, then I'm fine with it. If it just it gives you the option. Yes. Okay. Alder Barrigal. If we use someone outside of the police department, would that person have to be bonded? I, I don't know. That would be a question for the city attorney, but I, I mean, the police officers aren't bonded per se. I was thinking that if, if it's anyone, it would likely be DPW. Um, it probably wouldn't be a third party. Um, it, DPW is already kind of responsible for the maintenance of, this, of the, um, the meters, so that's kind of what I had in the back of my mind. Um, and in that case, again, it would be a city employee, but if it were Brinks or, or you know, Stockton Security or somebody, then probably we would want to get Big some um, exist. something along with that contract that would yeah. um, allow us to, to kind of collect some against sort of it. protection for the city. Yep. 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 All right. Any further comments, questions, or discussion on the motion on the floor? Seeing and hearing none. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Alderman Cooperly made the motion to send the statement which will appear in the newspaper warning of the new parking ordinance to the full board for approval and I so move. Second. The motion has been seconded. Any comments, questions, or discussion? Seeing and hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. All right. The meeting adjourned at 5.52 p.m. Great. Mr. City Attorney, do we have to add anything to this or are we good to go? Nope. That one is <laughs> that one's actually good to go. Awesome. No additions. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, that's it for reports of standing committees. Moving on to reports of representatives. Seeing none, we have none. Reports of select committees. We have none. Positions, letters, and miscellaneous communications. We have none. Board of Control Commissioners. We have none. Board of Cannabis Commissioners. We have none. Any unfinished business to come before the board? Alderman Talbot. Yeah, I just wanted to see um, where we were at with the upgrades to the chambers that we had allocated ARPA funds for. It's been about six months since we met about that, and I just wanted to check in and see if you knew where we're at. Okay. Did you want to speak to that? Sure, I can. Um, there was an RFP. There was a delay in getting the RFP put together. Um, my understanding is that there's now a model draft that we're working off of, so hopefully that can be out soon. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions on that, Alderman Talbot? Okay. Um, any other unfinished business to come before the board? All right. <clears throat> Miscellaneous motions, resolutions, and new business. We have to circulate the bond warnings for signatures, and we'll vote to approve the language for the ballot. So, someone want to make that motion? But we're circulating the resolution. Right. So, Mr. Clark, do you want to explain what we need to do here? So, under normal circumstances, our old bond counsel is Paul Giuliani. Mm -hmm. Paul been around for a long time. He was great to work with. Um, was 100% sure of what was going on and stuff. We have a new bond counsel. He's very good. They're very good. They just do things a little bit differently. Might be dotting a couple more I's, crossing a couple more T's uh, in that capacity. So. You know, back in the old days, I used to be able to do a bond warning where I could list the information, the ballots, the time uh, the polls were open, the polling locations and stuff, and we were set to go. This bond council is, is looking at listing that stuff, but he's looking at having you folks sign off on it. So that's the motion to circulate uh, in that capacity, at which point in time, under discussion with the attorney, I think for housekeeping measures, we'll have this to secure because there's other paperwork that once the election's done, it doesn't end the process of the bonds. There's a collection of the materials that has to then be moved on to the financing aspect and those kind of things. But I think we're going to be able to use, you know, our normal bond warnings and stuff. And then we have what I classify as resolutions. They're the whereas. Uh, and these were documents that the bond council asked for the board to basically approve. So it will designate that they were presented uh, during a meeting. Um, they were discussed if there was any so-called recommendations, a motion was made to approve and second. Uh, so basically, I think, unless Attorney Bloomer has a better idea, a motion to circulate the bond warning for, for signatures and to approve the 
Do we state them as resolutions or the whereas documents? Um, yes, I think they're, res they're resolutions. Um, yep, I, and I would do them individually, even though I think that they're going to be probably unanimous, all, all three. Okay. But just, just again, um, and to Henry's point, so Paul Giuliani was our bond counsel for, well, probably since at least you've been here, right, Henry? Yep. And he uh, unfortunately passed away er earlier this year. Um, and so having new bond counsel, which, you know, every attorney has a little bit different way that they um, prefer to do things, plus <coughs> up to speed on, on the way that we like to do things, especially uh, listing the, the, the dollar amounts out separately like we have done in the past. So that's why there's a little bit of, uh, of a learning curve for everybody involved right now. Um, uh, but to answer your question, Henry, that makes sense, I think, to do four um, individual motions, one to circulate the document uh, that, that was provided, and then the other uh, three, three motions ones. would be to resolutions. Uh, adopt the resolutions. Um, one suspension for all four, Attorney Bloomer, or will we need to do that independently? I think that would be fine to do one, sus one suspension. Great. Can I get a motion to suspend the rules? Come on. Second. We have a motion to suspend the rules. It has been seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. And then if we could have a motion to circulate the bond warning for signatures. Second. Second. Motion to circulate the bond warning for signatures. It has been seconded. Any comments, question, or discussion? <clears throat> Seeing and hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Now if we could have a motion uh, to approve bond article number one, resolution. So moved. Second. We have a motion to approve bond article number one, resolution. It has been seconded. Any comments, question, or discussion? And if you need to know, does anyone care to know what the bond uh, article number one is? It's the 35, or it's a $3.5 million. This one here is for the Grove Street and Lincoln Avenue um, reclamation, repair, rehabilitation, construction of city streets at a cost of one million, and uh, construction of city sidewalks for a million dollars, and then the culvert replacement at uh, one point five million. We have a motion has been seconded. Is there any further discussion? Seeing and hearing none. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Passes. The next um, motion would be to approve bond article number two, resolution. This uh, bond article is uh, in the amount of $2.5 million. It's subject uh, to reduction. This is to install or extend water mains and related appurtenances. That's how I can pronounce that within the city water distribution system. We have a motion has been seconded. Any comments, questions, or discussion? Seeing and hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. And the final motion would be for bond article number three. This is the one that had been reduced. It's for the $1.85 million, $1,850,000. Um, this is for the completion of a uh, combination Piedmont Pond Improvement Project at an estimated $750,000 and its construction and uh, completion of the Meadow Street combined sewer separation project at an estimated one million one hundred thousand dollars. Second. So we have a motion. It's been seconded. Any comments, question, or discussion? Seeing and hearing none. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. Thank you, Mr. Clerk. Mr. Mr. President. Yes. Due to our members who are not feeling well, do they have the right to sign this document because they're not here or? Can we give them special approval? Um, such a big thing they should. I don't think they would be allowed to, to, to sign having okay. not, not be in attendance. Because they had to vote to sign. Yep. I was trying to be nice. You know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we are still in miscellaneous motions, resolutions, and new business. Or is there any new business to come before the board? Going once, going twice. Okay, can you uh, give us language for our executive session this evening? Sure. Actually, Chief, do you have it? Uh, oh, sorry. I saw the, uh, I saw the uniform out of the uh, corner of my eye. Oh, okay. Thank you. Okay, it's a motion to find premature general public knowledge regarding the negotiation of labor relations agreements 
would clearly place the city at a substantial disadvantage because the discussion will divulge the board's position on the agreement provisions to be negotiated. So moved. Second. We have a motion has been seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Um, and did, did you want to invite, I don't know, are you Commander Prouty now? Or, okay. <laughs> Would you like to have him come in? To, okay, so motion to enter into executive session with the inclusion of the police chief, uh, Commander Prouty, mayor, uh, clerk, and city attorney to discuss the labor relations agreements as allowed under Title I, Section 313A1B. So moved. Second. We have a motion it has been seconded. Any comments, questions, or discussion? Seeing and hearing none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. We'll take a five minute break and then we'll start an executive session. I want to go home.